Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12. And Hebrews 12, and if you put a bookmark in Proverbs 4, that would probably be helpful. Hebrews 12, Proverbs 4. I'm still convinced that the bookmarks in your Bible are faster than trying to flip on your phone from one passage to the other, right? It really is. Just put a few bookmarks in your Bible, and uh, that'll make it easier for, for us in a few moments when we get to that passage. Question. Do you have any difficulties in your life presently? Struggles? Is there anything, any pressures in your life currently um, that you have found are making your spiritual life more difficult? Um, or we could say, is, are there any pressures or struggles, um, worries, anxieties in your life presently that um, maybe are making your personal spiritual life difficult, um, even to the point where maybe it does not even enter into your mind about how you can be a help to others because your personal struggles have caused you be, to become very self-focused. Uh, could, could that be an accurate description of, of where you are at in your life now? Uh, all of us, to a certain degree, have that. We live in a culture that is corrupted by sin. And the Bible says all creation groans and travails you know, as, under the curse of sin. And we ourselves are sinners, so we have the external pressures and the internal pressures constantly. Um, and there's a temptation because of the struggles of this life, to become incredibly self-focused to the point where we become really useless uh, as far as having an impact in the lives of others. This is important for us to consider because as we've been learning on Sunday nights and as we as a church have decided that, you know what, we want to be equipped. We want to be better equipped to do spiritual good in the lives of others uh, for their sanctification. And uh, so we've been embarking upon that. And we've really taken on some, some personal training as far as how we can uh, counsel and help others. And so this is an essential question because if we as a church are concerned about our church culture, if we desire to be vessels and instruments used for others, we need to learn how to rear up under the pressures of this life with a willingness and an ability to help others even while things are difficult for us. It's very easy for us to exempt ourselves and to say, well, how in the world can any reasonable person expect me to be concerned about others when I'm going through this? How can anybody expect me to be useful for others or to encourage others in their spiritual life when I'm struggling in this area? And, and so there's, there's the constant pressure because this life is broken. We are broken, and so there's always pressures, and there will never be a time where we can say to ourselves, you know what, when things start going easy, then I'll start thinking about helping other people. We find the Hebrews experiencing just such a struggle. The, the, the author of Hebrews, and uh, in my notes I started just having put AOH, author of Hebrews, author of Hebrews, author of Hebrews, because I'm so used to saying, the Apostle Paul says, Peter said, it can't do that, we don't know who wrote the book. So the, uh, the author of Hebrews has written to present the superiority of the Lord Jesus Christ throughout the epistle. He, he's... He's encouraging us to see the superiority of the sacrificial of Christ over the sacrificial system of Judaism. The recipients of this letter are suffering persecution because of the name of Christ. This has led them to a temptation to return back to the sacrificial system. They're, they're tempted to deny Christ, to return back. Why? Because, not necessarily because they think that system is the best, but because they want to remove the stigma that confession of Christ as Lord brings. And so that's the temptation in their lives. The strain of Persecution, temptation, temptation to return to the old system to succumb to pressure or to give in to spiritual fatigue. So, now this is a different context than us, obviously, but we can relate to that. You understand that your confession of the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord brings with it, uh, what? An obligation to stand against all contradictory claims. Christianity is, a, is, is, is an exclusive religion in that we declare the exclusivity of Christ. And so a confession of Christ of, of Lord uh, requires or gives us a mandate to stand against all contradictory claims. That in and of itself brings stigma from a pluralistic culture. Our confession of the holiness of God brings with it a commitment to biblical morality. 
which causes us not only to clean up our own lives, but also to stand against uh, the ever-increasing encroachment of immorality in our culture. Identifying with Christ naturally and normally sets the believer outside of the mainstream of society, and so uh, that brings stigma, doesn't it? We become ostracized, we become uh, the offcast of society, and even in some cultures, persecution. That's just reality. That's what the confession of Christ brings. And so uh, being a Christian brings those pressures. The Hebrews were feeling those pressures. So our confession of Christ brings real life strain and temptation. And we, we feel the pressure to succumb to that, and some do. Some fall to the pressures by rebranding their faith in such a way that it becomes more palatable to the culture. We want to remove the stigma of Christ. Now, oftentimes it's under the guise of we want to reach the culture, but in reality, it's a response of of fear of the culture. And so we're not trying to make the faith acceptable to the culture. We're trying to make ourselves acceptable to the culture. And so we rebrand Christianity and water it down in such a way that the culture can ingest it. Others succumb to the pressures by entirely falling away from the faith, returning to their prior lifestyle. That'll remove the stigma of Christianity. Any lifestyle that spares them the stigma of real convictional confession of Christ. And so that's the temptation that every uh, believer faces. And so the writer of Hebrews spends much ink extolling the virtues of Christ, the superiority of Christ. He brings a better covenant, a better sacrifice, a better priesthood, and thus a greater salvation. And so the product of the salvation that's Uh, Christ brings is a superior faith. Not only one that saves, but one that keeps us or enables us to endure, not only in the next life, but in this life also. And so, the writer of Hebrews in our passage is going to encourage his recipients to get busy. The faith which Christ gives can endure the pressures of life. And so, Uh, Just in chapter 11, the the, the chapter before, what we see is this litany, uh, this list of believers who have gone on before us who have lived lives of faith. Why is that there? It's there so that we can see that the very faith that we have, the faith that we share is a faith that can endure. It can endure external pressures. It can endure internal pressures. uh, And not only that, but it shows us that our faith will bring suffering and persecution, and that is to be expected. But it endures. That is the nature of our faith. And so... Our faith can grant boldness in the face of persecution, suffering, social stigma. It can enable us to boldly declare our allegiance to the Lordship of Christ and all that that entails, no matter the earthly discomfort that threatens us. And so, here in the context, we have the author giving us in the previous chapter, and uh, we're going to be looking at in verse 12 through 17, Uh, But in chapter 11, in in coming up to to verse 12 of Hebrews 12, the author of Hebrews gives many different reasons to be encouraged. And what he does is he lays out for his authors, or for his uh, recipients, he says, first of all, understand that the suffering of saints is to be expected. And so that's Hebrews 11, right? That's that's a hall of faith. It's, It's to be expected, but our faith endures. And so that's chapter 11. Now, verse 12 He says, not only look to other saints who have suffered, but then look to the Lord Jesus Christ, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, suffering the shame, and so on. And so look to those who have gone on before you. Look to the nature of the Lord Jesus Christ, how he handled suffering. And then he says, understand that your suffering is is not an indication that God has forsaken you, but it's an indication that you are a child of God and that he's working actively in your life in order to shape you in the mold of holiness and righteousness. And so he gives those three encouragements. Uh, Look to those who have gone on before you. Look to the example of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and consider uh, your standing as sons before the Father. So be encouraged by all of that in the midst of suffering. Be armed with that understanding. He's trying to help them form a worldview, right? A biblical worldview. Uh, Our faith brings suffering. It's okay. Our faith endures. Uh, The the chief of our faith, the Lord Jesus Christ, our greatest example, endured suffering for the joy that was set before him, so follow his example. Also, this is a mark of your sonship, so uh, have joy. God's working in your life. Okay, that's our worldview when it comes to suffering. So armed with that understanding of our faith and a realistic understanding of the earthly consequences of confession of the Lord Jesus Christ, 
He then comes to verse 12, and this is where our passage begins, and I already read it earlier, so I'm not going to read it again now. Verse 12, he says what? What's the first word? Therefore. 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 On the basis of all I just said about suffering and the encouragements we should take, therefore, now do this. Okay. We're going to look at responsibilities. And that's what this therefore introduces. On the basis of all that I just said, we have some responsibilities in this present world. And what we're going to find is that the author of Hebrews, and I love this so much, he goes from you're downtrodden, you're being persecuted, you're tempted to return, you're weak, you're tired, I understand this, spiritual fatigue, you're on the verge of succumbing to it. And what does he do? He doesn't come there and pat them on, on the head and, and say, it's going to be okay, it's going to be okay, just worry about yourself. Isn't that what you see all the time? You know, well, how about these people that devise their theology through memes, right? You, you see this on social media, people, their whole worldview is, is formed by memes that they enjoyed and they reshare them, right? Uh, and so I got to look out for number one, right? I'm just concerned about myself. What does he, what, what does the author do? In the midst of your struggle and suffering, take encouragement and then now do this. And he gives them responsibilities. And so he introduces responsibilities even in light of the, of the difficulties they are facing. This is not truncated or scaled back. He's not saying, okay, considering the circumstances, because you're suffering, how about you just do this? No. He gives them a high calling. The author makes it clear that we should not only get ourselves together, but in doing so, we should do so in a way that enables us to overflow in spiritual help for others. That's what we're going to see. We're not going to finish it today. Not even close. I tried. We're not going to do it. His expectation is that every believer make personal spiritual progress, so that they can live selflessly for others, even in the midst of suffering. Because get it straight, the suffering's not going anywhere. That's the nature of this life. That's what makes us say, your kingdom come, right? And so, he gives us some responsibilities. We're going to look at them under three headings. We might get to two today. We're going to look at these responsibilities under the headings of strengthen, verse 12 and 13, strive, verse 14, and oversee, verse 15. And so first of all, strengthen, verse 12 and 13. Therefore, lift up your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. And so again, these believers had allowed the pressures of life and the social stigma and the threat of persecution, the sorrow of suffering... Uh, the temptation to return to the sacrificial system to render them weak and near despair. The author uses a striking word picture here. He says, lift up your drooping hands. The word there for lift up has the idea of setting, like setting a bone. And so the picture is this. You have somebody with two dislocated shoulders and their arms are just hanging there, right? Useless. The point is that these men, the recipients, these believers, the recipients of the letter had allowed the pressures of this life to render them useless. They had been so beaten down with persecution, so ostracized by society, so caught off guard by suffering, now their lives uh, were, were really useless when it came to their own pursuit of holiness and spiritual good for other people. Far from being vibrant testimonies of God's transforming grace, which is what they should have been, they had become dominated by their own human fears and failures. It rendered them useless. Now, if you read verse 12 all by itself, lift up your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight... You think, well, that's kind of insensitive. You don't go to somebody, you know, they got their, their shoulders dislocated and their arms are just hanging there. And you say, lift up your arms, right? Get to work. That's insensitive. Is that the point here? No. You're not being insensitive. Get yourself together, man. <laughs> Get to work. Get over your own struggle. That's, that's not the attitude. Because remember what he's already done. He's already given them theology. He's already said our faith endures. He's already said there's been hosts and generations of believers that have gone on before us with the very same faith you have, have suffered greater than you've suffered, and have come through stronger on the other side. 
He said, your, your Lord and Master endured suffering for the joy that was set before Him, and He was exalted as a result. He says, you are children of God, and God is disciplining you and chastising you, and it's a mark of sonship. He's given them theology. Then He says, therefore, this is not insensitive. This is how the faith works. Take what you know. Take what you have been taught, the truths of theology, preach it to yourself, and then, what? Get busy. Take the mandate that God has given you and your responsibilities and get to work. Apply the theology. Preach theology to yourself. That's the point. The approach to encouragement here was not a plan for them to escape suffering. It was not the offering of friendly platitudes. It was the offering of deep theology and eternal truths. The, the, the concern, and this should be concerning to all of us, is the fact that our present, present state of Christianity is such that there's no, there's no, there's no uh, appetite for theology. There's no desire for deep truths. There's whole churches that model their entire methodology and philosophy of ministry uh, upon that idea that, that we're not going deep, and if you want deep theology, go somewhere else. This is how the faith works. We learn theology and then we say, therefore. And so the author of Hebrews says, your entire worldview and how you handle suffering and how you respond to the pressures of this life is going to be driven by what you know about God and the Christian life. And so theology, the author did not give a theological treatise to parade his intellect. That wasn't the point. It wasn't simply to fill the brains of his readers. He understood the importance and the effectiveness of a biblical worldview, and he wanted them to have it. His expectation was that the believers would respond to these truths with practical outworking. And so, uh, men have gone on before us, suffered through the centuries, yes, for their faith. You are not alone. That's the point. Your suffering is not abnormal. It's not unexpected. Not only have others suffered before you to a greater degree than you, but they've come through it stronger than they went in. Yes, Jesus Christ suffered on our behalf, and if our master was treated that way, then certainly we will be treated that way as well. The student is not greater than his master. The world hated him. He's going to hate, it's going to hate us. Yes, we're children of God. God's tending to us. He's pruning. He's chastising. He's disciplining. He's bringing us through difficulty, not from difficulty, and we can take heart because we're children of God. So now, therefore, Lift up those drooping hands. Strengthen those weak knees in response to spiritual realities. Count them as real, tangible truth. That's what that's the definition of faith. Faith is the substance or the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So take those truths, count them as real, and then, and then live in response to them. But we're not actually talking about hands or knees here. It's not the point. We're talking about fears and anxieties and sorrows and worries and doubts and temptations. All those things that we've allowed to dominate our hearts. All those things that have rendered us useless and self-focused and self-centered. or determined that we can be no help to anybody else because of what we're at. That's what we're talking about. We need to understand that faith means living this life in light of spiritual reality, spiritual truths. That's the difference between us and and, and the unbeliever. We understand there's a spiritual realm and there's spiritual truth, and that's what causes us or drives how we respond in this life. So lifting up the drooping hands and strengthening the weak knees means to answer all my fears and anxieties and doubts and worries with the assurances that God has given me. It's to respond to my own wavering and temptations with the convictions of those things that have been taught. What God has taught me and promised me and assured me of in the spiritual realm, I allow to drive my actions, to dominate my thinking and feeling in the physical realm. And so the author continues in verse 12 and 13. Therefore, lift up your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees. And I said it's not insensitive, but it is direct. It's not insensitive, but it is direct, right? Um, Because it it, it does kind of sound like pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. Right? Take your, your dislocated arms and put them back into joint, you know? Uh, because we understand that on a spiritual level, the Holy Spirit uh, works in us, God works in us, and uh, He's the one that's going to encourage us. And so get it together. 
get it together. Take some initiative. Yes, be disciplined. Yes, kind of, you know, get over yourself. And so he continues, lift up your dripping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet. Make straight paths for your feet. Now, in the previous chapter, the author started using a race analogy. And so, you know, uh, or even in this chapter, uh, in verse 1, he talks about laying aside the sin that besets you or, the, or that encumbrance that holds you back and the, that race analogy. And so he kind of continues it here and he says, make straight paths for your feet. He's saying, once you have set your joints and strengthened yourself, then set out upon a determined, consistent course without deviating from it. Set out on a consistent, determined course without deviating from it. So more than just lick your wounds in the midst of suffering, uh, more than that, it's, okay, now get up and go. Get to work. No more going astray. No more deviating from the faith. No more succumbing to pressure. No more vacillating. Uh, No more on again, off again with your faith. No more half-hearted devotion. That's the idea. No more sidelined by persistent habitual sin. No more domination by fear or doubt or worry. No more shrinking in fear from those around you. But strengthen yourself. Set your course. Remove any encumbrance. And walk the faithful, enduring Christian life until the end. So that you can say, like, Paul, I've run my course. I fought a good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. That's the idea. But again, I hope I don't have to qualify it, but I'm going to anyway. We understand that this happens not simply through self-determination and self-effort, but through the means of grace. The writer seems to be alluding to a similar encouragement that we find in Proverbs 4. And so look at Proverbs 4. So the author of Hebrews says, Make straight paths for your feet. And again, it seems as if he's alluding to Proverbs 4, so we're going to read Proverbs 4. And so in Proverbs 4, we have instructions for the young person. And here's the thing. We, We cannot ignore the reality that the Christian faith is presented to us, oftentimes in the context of farmer, athlete, soldier, and and even the young man. The idea being that the Christian life does require energy. It requires discipline. It it, it requires effort. It requires labor. It requires sweat. That's all true. And and so uh, as much as I I want to say this is not a matter of pulling ourselves up by our own bootstraps and just saying, oh, just be disciplined and get to work, uh, the reality is, however, that because of the nature of our bodies and our nature and the internal and external pressures, there is work. We have to be watchful, we have to be on guard, we have to be self-disciplined, and so on. And we're going to see that in Proverbs 4. This is written to a young man, encouraging him in the faith. In Proverbs 4.20, it says, My son, be attentive to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Let them not escape from your sight. Keep them within your heart. For they are life to those who find them and healing to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. Put away from you crooked speech and put devious talk far from you. Let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet, then all your ways will be sure. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Turn your foot away from evil. So that's the idea. As you make a straight path, you walk the straight path. You don't deviate from the left or to the right, and you keep good watch on where you are stepping. And so you can look at Proverbs chapter 4 and do look at it. And and we can go through here and we can kind of pull out some principles for for walking this straight path or making straight paths for your feet. And verse 20 to 22, he says, heed instruction. Heed instruction. That requires humility. It requires being a lifelong student. Heed instruction. Be humble. Receive teaching with meekness. Heed instruction. Verse 23, keep your heart with all vigilance. So guard your heart. Why? Because it's it's from the heart that flows all the issues of life. The heart, your entire internal person, your mind, your emotions, your will, all that you are internally must be guarded. Why? Because it's designed to be influenced by the Word of God, uh, divine truths, molded and shaped by the Holy Spirit, but also can be shaped and formed by the world. 
And so guard your heart. Heed instruction. Allow that instruction to penetrate so that it molds and shapes your internal person. It develops your worldview. It, it drives your mind, your emotions, and your will. And then guard that, right? Heed instruction. Guard your heart. Verse 24. Control your mouth. Put away from you crooked speech and put devious talk far from you. You think, well, that's kind of out of place. I mean, that seems kind of superficial. That seems kind of like, you know, uh, just kind of thrown in there. There's a very practical uh, um, lesson there. Control your mouth. Watch what you say. Why would he say that? Because what comes out of our mouth is indicative of what's in the heart. And so if we're concerned about guarding the heart, and then all of a sudden this is coming out of our mouth, we realize I haven't been guarding my heart very well, have I? It's out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. And so heed instruction, guard your heart, control your mouth. Verse 25, that your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. Set your path. Be determined. Single-minded. This one thing I do, I press towards the mark, to the high calling, right? I mean, th this is my single-minded devotion. Jesus Christ, above all. So set your path. I know what God would have me to do in my life is determined to see that through. You set your path. And then, verse 26, ponder the path of your feet, then all your ways will be sure. Watch your step. Set your path, watch your step. I know where God wants me to go. I know what His will is for me, so I better watch how I walk. If this is the path, then I know that this is going to be unhelpful for me. If I deviate this way, that's going to be unhelpful. If I deviate that way, that's going to be unhelpful. Uh, and so I know what God wants me to do, so I'm going to watch my step. Simple enough. Set your path. Watch your step. Verse 27. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Turn your foot away from evil. Stay the course. Stay the course. Set your path. Watch your step. Stay the course. This is, this is endurance. This is faithfulness. This is perseverance. And so the writer of Hebrews says, make straight paths for your feet. The illusion being, hey, heed instruction. Guard your heart. Control your mouth. Set your path. Watch your step. And stay the course. It's determination. It's clarity, understanding what God would have of us and then sticking to it. Deliberate faithfulness, which requires personal discipline and watchfulness. Oh, and then you say, man, that's easier said than done. That's easier said than done. That doesn't, such determination doesn't all of a sudden make my struggle disappear. It doesn't all of a sudden make my insecurities disappear. And you're right. So what do we learn? The battle of enduring faithfulness always takes place within the context of personal struggle. That's Romans chapter 7. If you and I are waiting around for the difficulties to clear up so that then I can succeed in the Christian life, you don't have, an, you don't have a biblical understanding of your own nature and the nature of this world and even the nature of salvation in this life. We're never going to be serving God free from Encumbrance. We're never going to be serving God free from personal struggle. We're never going to be serving God free from the continual pressures of our own sinfulness. But we determine and we heed instruction, we guard our heart, we control our mouth, we set our path, we watch our steps, and we keep the course. We do that while experiencing those pressures. So how then do we still move forward sensing our own weakness and inability and failure? How can we ever be a help to others when I'm so discouraged about who I am? My own personal struggles. Get over yourself. It's not about you. It's about God. It's about His glory. You're weak. Yeah. You are. You're a sinner. Yeah, so am I. You fail. Yes. You know how much of a sinner you are? I include myself. Even the confession of your sin is tainted by sin. You and I repent, and sometimes repentance lasts exactly two and a half minutes. You come to church, don't turn off your ringtone. That's how bad we are. I'm not going to look up to see who that was. Was it Ray? I know it's Ray because her face is red. <laughs> so, sorry, now it's redder. So. How... Can we be a help to others when we are overcome with our own sense of inferiority and our own struggles, our own keen awareness of our spiritual struggles? 
we talked about it this morning in Equip. We've been talking about it on Sunday evenings. A biblical worldview means a biblical anthropology. You're a sinner, I'm a sinner. The world is constantly pressuring us with sin and temptation, and we fall short. What is God asking from us? God is not asking for a sinful perfection so that then we can go and help others. Uh, you know, what he's asking from us is a confession of absolute dependence upon him. He's asking of us uh, repentance, yes, a pursuit of holiness, yes, we'll see that later on in the passage, but ultimately what he's asking of us is an absolute conf- or a confession of absolute dependence upon him. Lord, you know who I am. You know I'm weak. You know I'm frail. You know I don't feel able to do this. And you think I'm not preaching or teaching something new here. This is the story of every character that God uses from Genesis uh, to the end. Isn't that what Moses did before God could use him? I'm so weak. I can't speak. David? Key figure in all of Israel's history. And and who is he? What do we know him for? Psalm 51. Gives into his own lusts. I mean, he's a guy who didn't have his own sensuality under control, apparently, at, at times of his life. Publicly confesses. We have inspired scripture, Psalm 51, of him confessing his inability and his dependence upon God and his need for forgiveness. Yeah. You think God wants you to be better than David before you can help others? God wants you to be better than Moses before you can help others? Absolutely not. I want you to have the same confession of dependency. Lord, I'm frail. I'm weak. I can't do it in and of myself, but I want to be used of you, so forgive me. Help me to pursue holiness. Set out upon that uh, that path and then be used of God. Look at the remainder of verse 13. Make straight paths for your feet. And I think this is where this gets really exciting. Verse 13. Make straight paths for your feet so that Isn't that exciting? So that, for what purpose? What is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Here's a motivation for you. This is a mandate. And that's why I say that God, and I'm not trying to be flippant when I say things like get over yourself. I'm not saying get over yourself as far as, oh, you have such a high view of yourself. You need to get over your low view of self. Not because you're anything, but because God wants to use your nothingness for his glory. So stop focusing on yourself, either exalting yourself or or being self-deprecating. Either way, you're focusing on yourself. Get over yourself. God wants to use you as a vessel. And so here's a mandate. Get yourself together. uh, Strengthen, lift up the dripping hands, strengthen the weak knees, set your path, be determined, so that others, what is lame, may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. He wants us to know that there's much more resting upon the, our personal faithfulness than just our personal lives. The author wants us to know that we've set our own spiritual life in order because we have responsibility to others, especially those who are weaker than us. That's the idea. What is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. So, so, so that those who are weak are not pushed over the edge into full-fledged abandonment of the faith. So don't make it more difficult for the weak, but make it easier for the weak. That's the idea. Strengthen yourself spiritually so that, what, uh, so that others are encouraged. Be faithful so that those who are wavering do not fall, by the, uh, fall from the faith. Get up, brush yourself off, be reminded of the spiritual truths, then begin living in light of those truths. Why? In part because we have responsibility for those who are weak around us. He says, make straight paths for your feet. Here's the idea. Pave the way. If you are off in the brush somewhere and you're going to go on some type of uh, some type of adventure, I don't know. There's no pathway. You're the guy in the front, or or lady. We're equal opportunity here. Um, you're you're the guy in the front that has the machete and has the flashlight. You're, you're the one who's trampling down uh, the weeds and is hacking off the brush. You're the one who's clearing the stones out of the way and lifting those logs and clearing the pathway. You're the one who has the willingness uh, to, to suffer that discomfort, to put forth that extra effort. Why? You're making straight paths for yourself so that those who are weaker than you can come along behind you and have an easier pathway than what you had. 
That's the concept. That's the idea. Remove obstacles. Make the path clear. Make the path for yourself and then clear it so that others can come behind you. Be willing to do the hard work of hacking through the brush and clearing the boulders, trampling down the bumps so it can be easy for others, for those who are weaker. Listen. Be willing to take on the difficulty of life in order to make it easier for others. Do, do we have a situation where, where the vast majority of Christians are, are simply floundering in their Christian life? Ineffectual, unable, useless, because they're so encumbered by their own sin and their own lust and their own self-focus? The picture here is the idea, and, and this is for everybody, the, the idea is that we get up and say, no, it's my responsibility to take the arrows. It's my responsibility to put forth the effort. Because I have to be concerned about others. Be willing to take the lead so that others are emboldened to follow. Now, we have a couple problems. One, sometimes we are so encumbered with our own sinfulness and self-focus that we're useless. But then sadly, some of us also, we're, we're not busy removing obstacles for others, but we ourselves become a stumbling block to others. In Romans 14 and 1 Corinthians 8, in both of those passages, they're, they're, they're both warnings from Paul. He warns believers not to become a stumbling block to others, and so you get the same picture. Instead of removing obstacles for others, we ourselves become the obstacles. So Romans 14, 13 says, Therefore let us not pass judgment on another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. 1 Corinthians 8, 9, he says, but take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. Okay, you see parallels here. It's concern for the weak. Don't be a stumbling block to the weak. Now, the context of both 1 Corinthians 8 and Romans 14 is very similar. Both contexts are that of Christians, believers, who are um, taking it upon themselves as a right, their exercise of their Christian liberty. Now, the context is that of eating meat offered to idols and so on. We don't need to go into that context. But bottom line, Christians are taking it upon themselves as a right. You can't take this away from me because we're very Western when it comes to rights. You cannot take this away from me. I'm entitled to this, and you just need to deal with me as I exercise my rights. They're taking it upon themselves as a right the exercise of their Christian liberty. And so you can't tell me this is wrong, therefore I'm going to do it because it's my right with no care for how it's received by others. And what Paul is saying to the Romans or the Corinthians is, you're being a stumbling block. You're not paving the way. You're not making it easier for others. You're making it more difficult. You yourself have now become the obstacle. And he says, never, ever allow it to be. Decide to never put a stumbling block. And so get yourself together. We know we're suffering. That's human nature. That's life in this world. Yes, and you're going to have to serve God and others in the midst of it. And so lift up your dripping hands, strengthen your, your... And do it in response to the theology that you understand about God and about suffering and about Christ, but your relationship to Him. Then determine to set out upon the predetermined path, stick to it, and never be an obstacle. So do it always with others in view. Selflessness. Whereas God has called us to actively pursue the well-being of one another through a willingness to lead through self-denial and self-discipline, we often uh, gravitate towards self-indulgence, despite the needs of others. Whereas God called us, has called us to pave the way, clearing obstacles and setting an example, we often become an obstacle through the, our lack of example or our indulgence in Christian liberty with no care for how it's received by others. The bottom line is we have an obligation to others. Say obligation? Yes. It's a strong word, isn't it? We don't like obligation. We don't like mandate. We don't like to be told what to do. I said that we're very Western in our desire for rights. We're also very Western when it comes to personal autonomy and individualism. It's not, uh, don't put your Westernness uh, above your Christianness. They're incompatible in, in, in some areas, and this is one of them. We're to live selflessly for others. We have an obligation to others, even the denial of personal rights. Romans 15.1 We who are strong 
have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. You know what I'm yet to find in Scripture? It may be there, and you can tell me after if it is. I'm yet to find a passage where weak believers are enabled to identify themselves as weak. And what I mean by that is I don't think there's any room for somebody walking through the church or in the body of believers and say, well, I'm one of those weak Christians. I don't think it's something we identify our, ourselves And so a passage like Romans 15, 1 that says, we who are strong have an obligation to bear the failings of the weak, is written to everybody. Because we're all to be aspiring for the strength and to assume that position and to begin to live our lives selflessly for others as if we are the strong ones. Now, the strong ones can identify the weak, but the weaks cannot identify themselves as weak. There should be no professionally weak brothers. Well, you can't do that because I'm weak. I don't see that in, in anywhere in Scripture. But we do have those who should be able to recognize and say, you know, that's somebody who's struggling. That's somebody who's, who's weaker, who, whose conscience has not yet been fully formed by Scripture. They don't have a, a fully formed biblical worldview. And because of that, I'm going to watch what I do. I'm going to live in my liberty for their sake because I recognize they're weak. That's how it works. But even the weak one is being preached to by Paul saying, hey, you ought to be strong and you ought to be living so that your life is not an obstacle to those who are weaker. So, we have an obligation to others. Yes, even you, even me, even in the midst of your suffering and struggles. So we accept ourselves, we make exemptions, my weakness, my inability, my environment, my circumstances. Hey, earlier in the book of Hebrews, the writer says to everybody, saying, you ought to be teachers already. You ought to be teachers already. That's the expectation of everybody. There are no exemptions. Paul was a former persecutor. He had physical ailments. Suffered much opposition. I don't know what his his problem was when it came to uh, his health. It probably has something to do with his eyes. I can relate to that. Uh, to the point where he says to, to, to one church, you're willing to gouge out your eyes and give them to me. Uh, Timothy, he, he, had a, he had a different upbringing. He was raised by his mother and his grandmother. We don't know anything about his father, except that his father was a Gentile. Timothy struggled with timidity. He was very shy. He, he, his, his boldness was wavering in the midst of uh, struggle. So Paul had to encourage him. So, so Paul had a, had a history to live down as a persecutor. Paul had his own physical ailments. Paul always had opposition. Was he sidelined? Absolutely not. Timothy had a uh, maybe, maybe a difficult upbringing. It certainly wasn't traditional. Struggled with his own timidity. He had physical ailments as well. Was he sidelined? Not at all. In fact, Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. I'm making the pathway. You follow behind was Timothy sidelined? Not at all, except Paul said to Timothy, uh, entrust to faithful men the things that I've taught you that they'd be able to uh, teach others also. So he's saying, you lead, have others follow, and have them have others follow them as well. Peter, uneducated, impulsive, fearful of others, denied Christ. Was he sidelined? Not at all. Commissioned by Christ as a powerful apostle to the Jews. There are no exemptions. There are no exceptions due to circumstances or personality. And so we're going to end here, I think. So just as a matter of conclusion, we'll get into the next, next two points next week. Encourage yourself in the faith. Allow your mind and your hearts to respond to the truths of Scripture. Don't fear theology. Understand that theology is the lifeblood of the Christian life. It provides you the reason, the mandate for why we live the way that we do. Encourage yourself in the faith. Allow your mind and your heart to respond to the truths of Scripture. Not just for yourself, but for the sake of others. Understand there are a host of weaker brothers and sisters in the faith who need our example. They need us to rear up under the pressures of life. They need us to speak spiritual truths to their personal, uh, to our own personal fears and doubts and worries and insecurities so that we can set a path for them. They need to watch us set a clear and deliberate pathway of obedience and faithfulness 
They need to see us sticking to it, not veering left or right. More than that, they need us to be willing to pave the way to lead them so it can become easier for them to follow. So, the believer who has preached the realities of suffering and sonship to himself has determined to follow Christ with single-minded devotion in the midst of a difficult world. Now, let me ask you some questions in closing. Have you allowed the pressures of life to sideline you in the pursuit of personal holiness? And the balance of the passage deals with pursuing holiness. We'll get to that next week. Have you allowed the pressures of this life to sideline you in the pursuit of holiness? Have you allowed the pressures of your personal life to sideline you in your effectiveness in helping others for their spiritual good? Have you allowed the social stigma that comes with identifying with Christ to silence your testimony of Christ? Have you fallen prey to the temptation to uh, rebrand your Christianity, be more palatable to the culture in the name of reaching and not offending the culture, and really you're hiding behind that because you don't want the stigma that comes with a clear convictional confession of Christ? Have you convinced yourself that you are exempt from the vibrant, active pursuit of spiritual formation because your personal situation is too difficult? Have you become spiritually depressed by giving into doubts regarding God's loving care in the midst of your suffering? Have you given into self-centeredness, self-focus, or self-pampering in light of your personal struggles and disappointments? Have you been effectively neutralized in being an example and encouragement to others because of your weak spiritual state? Have you failed to live a life of determined conviction, setting a path for your life which you... Uh, on which you heed instruction, guard your heart, control your mouth, watch your step, and stay the course? Have you lived a life of indulgence and sin with disregard for the fact that it can cause fellow believers to stumble? Have you lived a life of free indulgence and Christian liberty without concern for how it affects weaker brothers? Have you allowed bitterness, jealousy, and selfishness to destroy peace and disrupt holiness? We'll see that next week. Have you failed to make every effort to pursue peace with all men, fellow church members, believers, not in your circle, and unbelievers, uh, and even enemies? We'll see that next week, too. Have you made it your highest priority to seek the holiness of God without which no one will see the Lord? That's the bottom line. We're going to continue through this passage next week, and we're going to see that the mandate, and we're going to continue down this road of mandate, the mandate for us, even in the midst of this life, even in the midst of personal suffering, is, is not only to set an example for others, but is to actively seek to encourage others so that, here's, here's my view of ministry. We wanted to pursue our own personal sanctification, right? I want to do as much as I can with all I've been given uh, for the glory of God while I await Christ's return, right? That's what I'm doing. That's my personal, that's my path that I'm following. Okay. Our responsibility then is to do as much spiritual good for others as we can to encourage them in their own endurance and perseverance so that they make it to the end right along with us, right? So that's our responsibility. And we're going to see how that plays out in Hebrews chapter 12 next week, and then we're going to see Hebrews chapter 3 as well. We're going to continue to apply these. And in the coming weeks, we're going to continue down this pathway, and we're going to help try to form a culture within our church help to shape our thinking in such a way that every member can feel themselves a minister of good, spiritual good for others uh, in the body. That's the vision. I hope you catch it. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word and that you've given us a faith which enables us to endure our own suffering. I think we live in a culture that's as an overemphasis on victimology, the idea that I am a victim, and because I'm a victim, I'm entitled. Because I'm a victim of others, and because I'm entitled, I look at others as perpetrators, I look at others as owing me, instead of, in look at, instead of looking at others as those who are to be served by me and influenced by my good example. Lord, help us to ensure that we have a biblical worldview a biblical understanding of suffering and sin and what life in this world is, is to look like. Uh, help us to understand that difficulty is here to stay as long as we are short of glorification. And then help us in the midst of this to pursue not only our personal holiness and sanctification, but to do it with an eye on others 
understanding we have responsibility. Our suffering should never neutralize us to, to the point where we're useless. It should never cause us to be so, so self-focused or self-centered or self-pampering that uh, we've forgotten about the needs of, of other believers. So Lord, help us to be effective tools in your hand to be used for the spiritual advancement, not only of ourselves, but others. Help us to seek to encourage, to bless, to be an example to those around us. I pray that that determination and conviction would characterize every aspect of our lives. So Lord, I pray you start with me, and I pray that you will help us at Calvary Baptist Church develop such a culture. I pray that every one of us would understand the mandate that we have to help others. And again, I just pray you develop that culture within us and help us to protect it. And I pray that many could come, be saved, grow, mature in the faith, become vibrant, thriving disciples, enduring to the end. Lord, we thank you for this. We, we praise you for your grace and for your mercy. Um, we thank you especially that you understand our frailty. You understand our weaknesses. Um, we don't need to hide those things from you. We don't need to pretend they don't exist. We don't need to go about life in self-effort. We just come to you and confess it, seeking your help. So Lord, we thank you for that comfort, uh, that you know that we're but dust. Uh, you're sympathetic to our weaknesses. So we thank you for this. We pray that you'd use our weaknesses for your glory and uh, help us to be effective uh, as we pursue your kingdom. We thank you for all of this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who's made it all possible.